Hello, and welcome to Danger and Refuge, a reading and conversation with Meg Carney and, Wh and Wyatt Townley. My name is Helen Hokanson, and I'm a reference librarian at Johnson County Library and one of the coordinators for our writing programs. Check out our Four Writers page for more information about our monthly contests, our upcoming conference, and other resources and events. Our Kansas City institutions stand on the homelands of Native American peoples at the juncture of the Missouri and Kansas rivers. In recent years, these nations have included the Delaware, Kansas, Missouri, Otto, Osage, and Shawnee. We pay respects to all indigenous peoples, past, present, and future, for their continuing presence in this land and the land where you may be joining us tonight. We are very excited to have Meg Carney and Wyatt Townley in conversation this evening. Meg Carney's All Morning the Crows, winner of the 2020 Washington Prize for Poetry, was published by the Word Works Press in spring 2021. Meg is also author of An Unkindness of Ravens and Home by Now, winner of the Penn New England LL Winship Award. A Heroic Crown, The Ice Storm, published his chapbook in 2020, and three verse novels for teens. Her award-winning picture book, Trooper, is illustrated by E.B. Lewis. Meg's poetry has been featured in Garrison Keillor's A Writer's Almanac and Ted Kuzer's American Life and Poetry series, and included in the 2017 Best American Poetry Anthology by guest editor Natasha Trethaway. She lives in New Hampshire and directs the Solstice MFA and Creative Writing Program in Massachusetts. You can visit her at her website, megcarney.com. Wyatt Townley is Poet Laureate of Kansas Emerita. Her four books of poetry include most recently, Rewriting the Body by Stephen F. Austin University Press, The Breathing Field, Perfectly Normal, and The Afterlife of Trees. Wyatt's work has been read on NPR, featured in American Life and Poetry, and published in journals ranging from New Letters to Newsweek, North American Review to Paris Review, Yoga Journal to Scientific American. Commissioned poems hang in the Johnson County Library and the Space Telescope Science Institute Library, home of the Hubble. So with that, I will turn it over to Meg and Wyatt. All right, thank you so much, Helen and Lisa Allen and Diane and Joseph, the whole team at the Johnson County Library. Um, and thanks to all of you for being with us tonight. Uh, Wyatt and I have prepared kind of a round robin sort of reading conversation. So I'm going to start us off by reading a poem and then we'll just chat uh, very briefly, and then Wyatt will read a poem and we'll chat a little bit, and we're going to go back and forth like that um, until we reach the point where we're ready to, to take your questions, and we're hoping we're going to leave you time to do that. Um, so, uh, since we're our theme is, is danger and, and refuge, we're going to be focusing on poems where we've handled kind of dangerous or otherwise slippery content um and or found refuge in in uh from said content in form and craft uh in poems so let me start us off with a poem from uh my new book all morning the crows this is ibis and what i'll tell you about ibis before i read this um thoth <laughs> which sounds like i have a list but it's T-H-O-T-H, -T -H, Thoth, uh, was the Egyptian god of wisdom and learning. Um, and he had the, the body of a man and the head of an ibis. Uh, and also just it's, it's um, helpful to know that certain ibises croak like a raven. Ibis. Her first mistake was trusting a god with the body of a man and the head of an ibis. 
People said he was old and bald and croaked like a raven, desired only shrimp and flies. But no, no, he was fine and smelled of salt. He knew her names, the one she was born with and the one she was given. Knowledge, he said, is a pond awake with fish. When he stripped her on its mossy bank and lured her in, she understood. Lily pads tangled around their knees. Her body was a map his hands had drawn. Beyond clear blue sky, she saw the moon full and stars in their constellations. If only she'd been satisfied. Instead, she tugged at his arm, insisting. For wisdom, he had to carry her to shore, lie her down, lay her down. She imagined the earth would open, reveal its golden center. But his bill was sharp. She thought he would be gentle. Yet with each peck, he drove her deeper, deeper, until she knew he had never truly been a waiting bird or a bastard child. He was God of a heaven where all the angels' bodies are broken. Wow. What an opener, Meg. Uh, I, you know, I, I read your work and I hear your work on the edge of my seat, and, but I'm half in your lily pond and I'm half you know, looking away in great trepidation. Uh, as I as I go down the page line by line and as I hear it now, uh, and it reminds me of an early review of my first book in which the critic said, "What will she do to me next?" <laughs> and and I'm struck by the difference in the hearing and in the reading that we have in response to your poem, where we are uh, going forward with trepidation, hearing your very um, startling imagery from lily pads to suddenly sharp bills to broken angels. And it just get, gets more and more um, jagged uh, along the way. Um, how that experience for us is quite different than perhaps the one you had writing it, which you might have approached these um, discoveries with glee. I recently heard uh, Nick Flynn in an interview say that um, the poem is is about the experience you have when you read it. The poem is about the experience you have when you read it. And I thought, huh, that's, that's a really fascinating way to look at it. And I wonder, well, is it same for the writer? Like, is the poem about the, you know, the experience you have when you're, when you're writing it? Um, but certainly, um, for me, I didn't have an, uh, uh, any glee when I, when I wrote this or, or even any trepidation, but, um, it, it, I think it came from like this, like not in my psyche, uh, if that makes sense, you know, we're always reaching for metaphor, right. To try to explain what we mean. Um. But I, I still feel that knot, even when I when I read the poem, and uh, you know the, these bird poems all gave me opportunities to play quite a bit with extended me metaphor, which um, is one of my you know favorite forms, and one of yours too. Um, you know, it's what we reach for when we're coming at this material that we just we can't come at it directly, you know. So we have to find another way in, and and. Um, there's certainly like no other way for me to say like what this poem says, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the best. 
it's, it's, it's at its best on the page or in the ear. Certainly beautiful. Well, Thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna counter your opening. <laughs> I would never open with this poem. Never in a thousand years, except you have thrown us into the deep end. You've thrown us into a a, a, a place where danger has no bottom. And so I'm going to respond with, with this, with this level. <clears throat> Black wedding train. Behind my back. The backyard, a black wedding train made of cat shit, weeds, and mud. In its folds, boys circle a girl face down in the dandelion. The ants bear witness to her fisted scream. I'm sorry, the, the ants bear witness to her fisted silence. And the zippers long scream. Birds fall out of the sky. Night falls, rain, then years behind the bride. Black wedding train, so heavy. Tin cans and trash bags. Get off. Get out. Disband the choir. This wedding train is trimmed with razor wire. This poem just, it cuts, uh, it cuts so deep, you know, and I think probably at least most women are, are immediately right down in that terrifying mud with that girl. Um, and I really admire your use of all the senses and how, how all those images keep like building and building and building, right? Until you, you reach um, that last tercet where there's um, a change in tone, right? And that declaration, it's almost like a, like a volta in a, in a sonnet. Um, you know, where there's, it's commenting, it's like looking back and commenting on what came before. And um, I'm so curious about how you reach that, that turn um, at the end of this poem, you know, and, and how you use extended metaphor to describe this experience um, and its related emotions that are really just kind of impossible <laughs> to put on the page. Yeah, it is impossible. I mean, some, some trauma is, is just a, it, it can't be faced directly. And so, uh, but like the sun, uh, can't look at it directly. So we have instruments. And, and one of the instruments we have as poets is metaphor. So this in terms of that, right? And so uh, if we can't face something directly, well, we, we have our shield here. Here's Athena's shield, which we borrow. Goddess of wisdom, we borrow Athena's shield to look over here at Medusa, right? Snake lady. And if we look at Medusa, we turn to stone. And so we have to look through Athena's wisdom or the wisdom of metaphor as poets in order to uh, address and, and slay Medusa or face, face the whatever it is. Um, so I'm very grateful. It's a very powerful uh, device. Uh, and one I use in my life, in my general conversation all the time. I'm always talking in metaphor and in my teaching as well. Um, to, to see one thing, disparate things, one thing in terms of another, so that um, it's not symbolizing another thing, but it's, it's, through, it's through the shield, it's, it's right through the scope of the other thing. And it yokes two very disparate things, whether it's a, a muddy black backyard and a, and a wedding train, you know, in a single image. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, it took me, in regards to the turn at the end, uh, it, it took me a lifetime to find the anger uh, in my own self about this particular event. And uh, then another lifetime to write about it <laughs> and, and perhaps a, a, an additional lifetime to find the right uh, metaphor at the end. And I was judging a poetry contest in which several prisoners had entered. And, and, and there was a lot of razor wire imagery in their submissions. And I thought, that's, 
just what I need. And 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 I um, I was so because we're playing as poets with trauma. I mean, it can be play, and it turns into play, which is extremely uh, life giving to us in terms of dealing with difficulties. And uh, and so I was just so um, gleeful, really, and so grateful to. Uh, to stumble upon that razor wire to finish my poem and then write a choir with in the church. It's very, very lucky. Thank you. Well, that, that's fascinating about finding the, you know, that last image of the razor wire by, by reading these poems written by um, the incarcerated uh, people who sent those poems in. Yeah, wow. Yeah. You, you, we never know where the seeds of our poems are going to come from or where, you know, the solutions to the, the, the problem we're facing in a poem might come from, right? And often it, it's from reading something else, right, that somebody else wrote. And we want to respond or they they go, oh, you know, we it triggers something for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to read a, a very short poem from Poem By Now. Uh, which came out in 2009. Um, and what what I'll say before I read this, um, so I'm a, a native New Yorker and I was living in Manhattan on September 11, 2001. Um, the view from my bedroom window where my writing desk was, uh, was the Twin Towers. I could sit up in bed and see the, the World Trade Center. Um, and then suddenly there they weren't you know um and like so many losses that one was very difficult to accept so this is called september 12th 2001 view of downtown manhattan from my bedroom window the amputee insists her legs are still down there she feels them burning. She knows when the smoke clears, they will be standing. Yeah, that just knocks us all out off our legs. Um, I'm interested in the, the title in reference to the poem. Uh, some poems are unlocked by their titles. And, and, and I must say, I read this poem several times, uh, think, you know, looking at it as a, a medical condition until finally I got, the, I got the metaphor, the obvious metaphor, which is that the towers were, were the, the the lakes and um, it was it was a revelation for me as a as a reader and was it a revelation for you also as a writer yeah you know it's funny um for the most part september 11th i wasn't writing at all about september 11th for many years um except for this one poem you know, for the most part, they the 9-11 didn't start popping into my work, you know, surprising me until after I, I left New York in 2005. But except for this poem, this poem came whole a day or two after the attacks. I'm standing on the roof of my building looking downtown and this, this like, you know, you're, you're, how do you make sense of that? How do you and how do you translate it? How do you tell people, you know, what it's like? And that that idea of um, the amputee and and you know the phantom limb, you know where people say they can still feel that limb even though it's not there, and it just seemed to, I just grabbed that you know as something um, to try to make sense of it all, and it felt like something other people might be able to relate to, and there was just like the tiniest bit of solace in that, you know. Yeah yeah such a it's such a a big poem and such tiny tiny lines it's like michelangelo you took away you know took away everything that wasn't the sculpture you took away everything that wasn't the poem and uh 
and, and still it's, it's so overpowering and in, in the little is the big yeah the title's about as long as the poem right um but yeah. often in the, the extended metaphor poem the only hint you have about what the poem is about about you know is uh is the title Yeah, yeah it's, it's an interesting relationship sometimes between title and poem. I love tiles. They're like micro poems. And, uh, it's true. They can be. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to, one of my fears, just jumping off of that, so to speak, um, as, a, as a former dancer and now as a yoga teacher is um, not having legs uh, or immobility. And so um, this was written during the years that I had my hips replaced. And uh, it's called uh, the, lesson. the Lesson. A girl needs a teacher. She walks into the classroom of the woods. I'm hearing a little echo there, Meg. Uh, a girl needs a teacher. She walks into the classroom of the woods. The trees advise her to grow down. She spends her life falling all day, each night. The wind assigns its infinite homework. The years inscribe their lectures in her scars. And when she finds she can walk no further. She plants her heart in the earth and children climb into her eyes. I, I love the ending of that poem. Um, but, but one thing I've noticed about your poems um, in the afterlife of trees and in rewriting the body is um, I'm just completely enchanted about their pacing and how, you know, it's mostly done uh, through lines and line breaks, stanza breaks. There's very little punctuation. It's, they're very spare that way in terms of punctuation. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what the impulse is behind that craft move and how you came to that. Is there a, a poet who inspired you um, in that way? Uh, has that evolved as you've, um, you know, evolved as, as a poet? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm this poet who I'm always cluttering up my poems with, with punctuation, you know, think of it as, uh, thinking of it as like musical notation, you know, but I think I have so much to learn from studying um, what you're doing just with space and line breaks um, to pace a poem. And I'm just hoping that you can just talk about that a little bit. Thank you. Um, my, my choice is often, I mean, it really comes back to my background as a dancer um, and a choreographer. I, I need a lot of space around my body. I have a very, well, I have a very large body, I'm very tall, and I, I have a very large kinosphere, a sense of uh, space that I need around my body, thus uh, subways in New York, very challenging body-to-body uh, -body, um, sense of spacing there, and I need a lot of space around myself and my body as I move through the world, and I also need a lot of space in my work as a poet around my words, and in fact, the the space around the words um, becomes uh, uh, as important, really, as the words. And I'm finding um, punctuation increasingly confining as a poet. It's like a, a fence or going back to razor wire or uh, it's, it's, it's a girdle. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a too tight a belt. And uh, I just want to... <sighs> get it all off, the earrings, the fringe, and, and be able to, to move freely and uh, let go of all the unessential. And I want to live there, and I also want to lure the reader there into this place of spaciousness and almost into a sense of anti-gravity. I mean, and, and my dream as a poet is to go up in space to, 
but but so and Merwin, for instance, who's a dear soul, and I feel very close to him, and um, he he always felt W. S. Merwin that um, punctuated. He always said that it, it stapled his poems to the page, and I couldn't agree more. So he gave up punctuation utterly, and of course, you know, so so many poets find their way there. But I'm I'm finding that. Uh, I want more freedom and less constriction as I continue my ripening. Yeah, that makes so much sense about, you know, the, the physical body and its translation onto the page too. Um, and I, yeah, I'm, I love Merwin's work too. So that makes, that makes sense that you would be a fan. Um, okay gonna stick with my my last theme a little bit here um and read in the days of code orange i think most people here can probably remember the days when when they were color coding how terrified we should be right uh, back in the bush years um so this is in the days of of code orange Terrorists might take the Empire State Building next, might take you or me or the red eye to L.A. Our fears escalate like the news anchor's tits. We're not sure if they're real or not. The men in black keep such secrets secured in the public's interest, yet they're never hung up by facts. Meanwhile, a woman dies cold in the park. An underemployed chef is driving a cab. A foster mother starves the boys in her care. The anthrax assassin sits tight in his lab. They'd drill ground zero if oil were there. Love, let's live by a code, the color of wine. We have this cup in so little time. Your work is so musical. Were you trained? as a musician or do you play or sing no i i played the flute as a kid um and i in recent years i've been teaching myself to play the ukulele but i'm now <laughs> a great choice i i need to return to the uke that's it that's a great idea um you know much of it's overt the news anchors tits the news anchors tits that's so uh, you know this, you get the spondy through the I am and the trochee there, but it's just, uh, and, and for those of you, it sounds so, um, this is a perfect Shakespearean sonic. And for those of us who are just hearing it for the first time or reading it for the first time, it, it's perfect. A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. She's got that beautiful wine and time couplet at the end. And um, you, you, you bury this so beautifully. You, you, some of your music's overt, and then some you hide and you bury so perfectly so that only the trained eye and ear can find it. And so my question is, um, how do you find your music and then how do you bury it? Uh, which is harder? Is it intuitive? Is it crafted? Et cetera. Um, my, my mentor was a poet named William Matthews, who I know you, you know who Bill Matthews was. Um, he, he always said that the, the poetic line is like a bar in music, you know, and that, that we compose by the phrase, you know, or by the line. Um, and as you're, you're writing the poem, you're listening to it and you're creating these like melodies and even counter melodies, you know, as, as you work. Um, and so I do aspire to, to write musically, um, 
but I think that, you know, the hardest part when you're writing like a truly formal sonnet is to make the language sound natural, right? I mean, I mean, Bill could do it really well. Robert Frost, you know, there, and there's so many poets today writing um, formal sonnets who, who do it so well. And I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm always successful, um, but for me, the Shakespearean sonnet is, is really the, the most difficult of, of the sonnet forms, you know, you would think, well, it's got seven rhymes as opposed to the Italian where you only have five, you know, and you'd think, oh, well, the more rhymes, the, the better, right? But for me, when you're trying to sound natural, if you've got uh, to close the poem with that rhyming couplet, it's really hard to make that sound natural, you know? And I mean, and, and if, if people hadn't caught on um, just hearing the poem for the first time, you know, that, that I was reading a sonnet, definitely by that last couplet, people, you know, who go, who know sonnets go, oh, that was a sonnet, you know? Yeah. Um, so, because you, you just can't hide that, that rhyming couplet at the end. Um, well, and it's so lovely in the way that it clicks, you know, it just, yeah, it just the right, at the end. It's right. so beautiful. Uh, uh, so, so are you searching for half rhymes as, as even more so than than uh, perfect rhymes? Yeah, I'm I'm big into internal rhyme, you know, um, yeah. and and definitely half rhyme, off rhyme, near rhyme, um, just you know, alliteration and you know that consonants and assonance, just trying to you know keep. You know, as I'm composing, I'm saying the words out loud, and that's what's helping to to guide me. You know, and then and you know, giving you ideas of what can come next. And and when you're thinking that way, it also helps you stop. You know, um, that critic on your shoulder who's telling you, you know, you can't say that or you can't write that because you're too busy. You know, writing. You know, following the strictures of the form. Right. Um, so that's one of those. You know, that freedom of form that that we talk about too, you know, and, and, yeah. and um, Molly Peacock would say that, you know, the, the form um, gives you like this safe house with, within which to explore this, this, you know, difficult content. And, and Bill would say, Bill Matthews would say that, you know, the whole function of form is to help you write the poem um, and, and, to help the reader read the poem you know, and give them a kind of a, a way of looking at it, you know, and I think really all of that's, that's true. Right. With formal work, right. especially. And you know. Frost would say, you know, free verse, you know, playing tennis without a net, oi, you know, nothing right. harder, right. right? Nothing harder. So form is less uh, a cage than a playground. A yeah. playground you know, with uh, with circles and bases and four square and hopscotch and basketball uh, free zones uh, and, right. and and we can just run around and within all those lines and 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 play our games and so it's so much so much fun whether it's an Italian sonnet yes. or in my case I I'm just in love with the villanelle I I love I love the villanelle and um, so I'm going to read a villanelle. And for those of us who haven't read um, one lately or written one lately, uh, it's it's a it's a very it's a short form, 19 lines. It's five tercets, three line stanzas, followed by a final quatrain, four line stanza. Uh, the rhyme scheme is very simple uh, for the ear. It's two rhymes, A and B, uh, simple for the for the reader, hard on the writer because <laughs> many many rhymes of A and B. And, uh, but the trick of it is, and the, the, the challenge of it is, the first line of the first stanza falls down to become the last line of the second stanza. Whereas the last line of the first stanza tumbles down and becomes the last line of the third stanza. So, so those first and third lines continue to cartwheel down the poem, ending subsequent alternate stanzas until they finally plummet to the bottom and become the final couple and are, are, are blissfully united. So it's very gymnastic. I just, I just love it. Um, this poem is, references a um, feeling of dread that sometimes we have uh, before knowing something. I know we've all had it. We've all waited for that kind of phone call that we know is coming. 
uh, where, where the dread may be worse than the news. It's called Nothing But Everything. Will it be good or bad? The news, when you're by the telephone with nothing but everything to lose. It's the call you won't refuse. You double check the dial tone. Will it be good or bad? The news. Make lunch, pick up a book, or snooze the day away before it's known if there's nothing, everything to lose. Why call it fair or foul? Choose your point of view before the phone announces good or bad, the news. Not bad or good, that's just reviews, or it's all good, or it's foreknown. Everything's nothing, win or lose. So play, you dogs. Never mind who's busy carving your headstone. Neither good nor bad, the news. Everything but nothing to me. I think you know how much I love this poem. Um, now, later this week, tomorrow in my craft talk, and then on Saturday in the in the workshop, um, I'll be focusing on sonnets and extended metaphors. But really, I just as easily could have focused on you know, villanelles um, and, and pantoons went to talk about, you know, finding refuge in form. Um, and I know you, like me, you know, you especially turn to the villanelle, you know, and it just feels right for the poem. Um, my first encounter with, with a brilliant uh, villanelle was probably um, Dylan Thomas, do not go gentle into this good night. And then it was uh, Bishop. Um, the art of losing, and uh, you know, both about really difficult subject matters. And I'm wondering what, for you, is the particular appeal of of the villanelle, um, especially when dealing with difficult subject matter. And, and when did you first in, encounter the form? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I just find it so gymnastic and fun. It's so mesmerizing. It's it's so comforting, and it's mesmerizing this and i love the the different facets that the first and third line reveal as they move down the page and are slightly very variegated varied varied uh depending on the new context of the new material it's falling into and so i just i just it's so again my dance background i love the movement of it and um and I feel comforted by that turning quality of it and that mesmerizing. I probably, uh, I think my husband, Roderick Townley, who's a wonderful poet, poet also, and a, a noted children's writer, um, he wrote a, a wonderful villanelle, his name is escaping me, but uh, it was through his work and also um, uh, Bishop's One Art and, uh, and, and Rothke's, um, Rothkies, I always mispronounce, I don't say it often enough in groups, <laughs> Theodore Rothke. Um, and I've, uh, the, and I'll get back to you on which, which one that was. I know, I'm trying to think of the Rothke villanelle too. All right, it's, it's on the shelf behind me somewhere. I know. Me too, <laughs> me too. We'll get back to that. Okay, um, I'm going to go back to All Morning the Crows and read Oriole. Um, and I'll, uh, a lot of these poems were inspired um, by a book called A Hundred Birds and How They Got Their Names. I kind of used um, that bird book as like a prompts. Um, and then these poems just kind of took off from there. And this is a quote from, from that book by Diana Wells. Uh, Orioles often use man-made materials for their nests. So the 19th century uh, ornithologist Alexander Wilson warned, warned women to keep narrowly watching their thread that may chance to be out bleaching. You know, because the Orioles might snatch it off the line. So this is Oriole. 
To build their nest, they stole my mother's cigarettes. Next, they snagged her booze. They took her heating pads and measuring cups, plucked her blood-soaked tissues, light bright as carnations from the wastebasket. They took her shopping list, zip-up boots, Katrina the cat feeding tube, her glasses and the book on her lap, filched her sweet dreams tea and her field guide to birds. It wasn't all in this order, but they stole her Easter wreath, the tumor in her throat, ironing board, perfect penmanship, black silk slip, her late night bowl of ice cream and Cool Whip. They tried to take her last words, but she snatched those back, took those with her. You keep knocking me back. Uh, your, your poems are so strong, Meg. Um, Thank you, Wyatt. So, uh, speechless here. Uh, the that was a list poem, and uh, and and it's interesting um, how the all the things that your mother lost became your clues on the trail of searching for her, like the red crust disappearing in the woods. Can you talk a little bit about your long search? Yeah, honestly, I wrote this poem more as a way of, of keep her, keeping her from disappearing in, uh, in 2010 when she died. Um, the idea of an Oriole stealing like a handkerchief for someone's panties off the line really ma immediately made my think of, of, uh, of my mom. Um, this is my adoptive mother that we're talking about who was a bird lover. And I have, you know, these memories of hanging laundry with her in the, in the backyard. Um, but although it's, it's, it's a list, what really helped me go from like one image to the next was, was again, like saying, saying it out loud and, and trying to let the, the words and the sounds, the sounds of the words lead me um, really as a way to, to guard, you know, guard myself emotionally from the content. Yeah. Um, it was a good distraction, I guess, from, from the content and, the, and from the loss. So it, the, the list became like guardrails. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, and those, the they were really breadcrumbs, you know, back to her to keep her from disappearing. Um, you know how we we try to hold on to the people we lose, like, like, oh, what did she smell like? You know, what did, what was she? You know, what would she say at this moment? What was she reading? What was you know? What was her favorite tea? Right? Anything you can grab, you know, and and shove in the in the memory box to hold on to somebody. Yeah. Even the ugly things like the cigarette and, and the booze, you know, it all goes in there. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's all in the basket. Yeah, yeah don't edit that. Um, so speaking of last words, um, I was very fortunate to be with my mother when she passed. And um, so I, I wrote this. <clears throat> and, and this is from Trees from a Train. I, I think it's a lovely book because I don't know if you can see it, but you see this tree on the front? It's the same tree. It's the same tree, different season. It's not dead. Not dead. It's just pretending. So, this is trees. It's 
So this, you, you wrote this uh, new book, All Morning the Crows, about, with the motif of crows. This is all about trees. Uh, came out a while ago. It's not my latest book, but same, same idea of, of using trees in all the poems. Trees from a train. A silence swells between your breaths, stilling the smallest of bones. The hammer, anvil, waiting for what is coming. I stroke your hair and hold your hand, the bed rail cold on my cheek. Your eyes locked in mine, then drifting to a distance into which I cannot see. Your breath drawing stars from all corners of the night through the funnel of your throat, louder than rain. A silence opens in all directions. The minutes slide by like trees from a train. And we ride, we ride. Past houses, past street lights, past the last landmark of anything we knew until the last one breathing is me. For you who gave me your my, mm. The last one breathing is me. For you who gave me my first breath have given me your last. Now oh, that's a poem that every time I read it and now hear it, you know, it just seems to affect me more deeply, which I think is is uh, a sign. And you know, that's what you want, right? On multiple readings or hearings of a poem, you want it to continue to resonate and to keep revealing it itself um, and resonating. Um, and it's really a, a, a perfect lyric, you know, this moment captured in time. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping you can just talk a little bit about the experience of, of, of writing this. Uh, for me, it, it brings up the issue of time in, in cre creating art about a tragedy or the difficult. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we need to marinate these things for years, as you mentioned, or uh, decades or lifetimes. Uh, this poem actually came fairly fast after my mother's passing and came rather of a piece, not unlike your World Trade Center poem. Uh, but, but what's interesting in terms of time between event and art, let's just call it art, um, whatever that time span is needed, um, the time within the event, the time inside a crisis is, is fascinating to me because uh, I don't know if you agree, but, um, in a crisis, um, time slows down. And it, and it stretches out into ultra slow motion. So I'm very interested in, in our perception of time um, and in capturing that uh, as a poet, in, in particular in this poem. Um, and so I was very grateful to find the metaphor of the train, uh, you know, passing, passing the trees. You know, I was a commuter in New York for many, many years. And passing the trees, passing the street lights, passing the houses, and then into a space where that n no one was familiar with, that was all new to me, in which there was nothing but silence. And Well, speaking of time, 
I think we don't want to run out. So I'll read one last poem and you'll read one last poem. Okay. Great. Um, I'm going to read Owl. This is from All Morning the Crows. It's so pretty. This is a pretty book too, right? Love that cover. Um, Owl. This is the first poem in the book. Owl. She birthed you, but she is so unknowable. Is that the word? Try nocturnal. Each night she glides on wings silent as a vole quivering under snow. Perched on your bedroom sill, she watches you dream twitch then spins her head to spy the snow mound ripple, sugary in moonlight as the vole tunnels past pines. She lifts off silent still and you, daughter of hurt and squeal, are awake. When you sigh, your heart shaped face aches is that the word try breaks knowing when she dies you'll inherit all she's swallowed whole it had to leave behind Daughter of Hurt and Squeal. That is so affecting in its viscerality. Is that a word? Visceralness. And its compression and such a beautiful daughterly line. Um, very affecting. I love how it begins the book you decided to close with it. Um, and I, I wondered if you absence such a, is such a theme in your book and the, the, the presence, the absence of presence, absence of presence. And uh, at some point, both in this poem and also in the book at large, seems to shift into a kind of presence of absence. So the absence of presence becomes a presence of absence and it looms larger in what is not there than in, in what is. And I, I wondered if you would talk about that. Yeah. Um, thank you for noticing that. It, you know, it's always so gratifying when people kind of pick up on what you're trying to do and you don't know if anybody's even going to notice. Um, but, you know, like most poems, this one's really difficult to, to talk about. And, you know, if you could have expressed it in any other way, you wouldn't have write, written the poem about it. But I mean, you mentioned the absence and the search for my my first mother, um, and bringing it to the page, and you know, bringing her to the page. And this is very much you know about that. Um, the project I'm up to my eyebrows in right now is trying to write her story. Uh, she gave me up when I was five months, and then when I found her in 1999, she was dead. Um, so that's in there too. Um, but again, you know, how else to go to these scary emotional places, but through metaphor, you know, what would we do without metaphor? Um, so that's what I'll say about that because we're running short on time. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to finish too. This will be my last poem. And, and, the, and the thing about metaphor and the thing about poetry uh, that I love is uh, it's always there. It's always there for People come, people go, whether as reader or writer, whether comes, whether goes, poetry is there for us, and its porch light is always on. Another metaphor. 
knowing the difference. The porch light is on. Its gold pours down around your ankle. It follows you up the curve of night, slides through rows of corn behind the parking lot. And when you have forgotten, the porch light is on, the glossy black and back of the water bug by the welcome mat, on the soundless harp of the spider behind the downstone. When you have not found what you have to lose, and your steps are slow with doubt, the porch light is on. Look down at your old shoes gleaming. You're the door. You're the difference between in and out. Thank you for that, Wyatt, and for spending this hour with me. I don't know if we have, have time for um, a few questions, but I think we should just let that poem just stand and, uh, and see if there's some questions that we can answer from the audience. And I can even, okay, here's Helen. <laughs> uh, that was amazing. I, if, if we were live, you would have seen a lot of this. That was wonderful. Um, I'll share with you, I was at the, uh, the Kansas Book Festival on Saturday and Michael Kleber Diggs was quoting Huascar Medina, who's the current Kansas Poet Laureate, and Huascar says, poetry allows me to speak hard truths in soft ways. And I mean, you all talked a lot about form and how form allows you to, to write the poem. Um, so I thought that was interesting. It was, a, it was a running theme both on Saturday and tonight. That was kind of beautiful. So um, we are at the end of our time, unfortunately. So I just want to invite everyone to Meg's Craft Talk tomorrow at 6.30. Uh, Diane will drop the, the registration link in the chat. It is Finding Refuge in Form, the Sonnet and the Extended Metaphor. And then she'll follow up with a workshop on Saturday uh, at one o'clock from one to three. And then, of course, um, I have to mention the upcoming uh, Writers Conference. It will be Thursday, November 4th to Sunday, November 7th. And check the Four Writers page that's in your uh, resources list. We will have registration. Um, registration will be up shortly. <laughs> it's not ready yet, but save the date. <laughs> and with that, good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Helen and Wyatt and, and everyone uh, out there in the audience. We really appreciate your coming and I'm sorry that we ran out of time for your questions. Well, and I'm sorry that we can't see you, but we feel you. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. And we'll hope to see you tomorrow and Saturday. Saturday, if you're there, I really will see you. Yeah. So thanks again and have a great night, everyone. <laughs>